Good morning. Welcome back to Mesot, Thailand. It is Thursday, July 30th, I think. And I'm heading out into Mesot for just a walk, really, just a walk around the city and get some exercise. I picked a direction at random. And I think what I'm going to do is head that way, <laughs> whatever that way is, and look for the spot where this main road crosses over the river that runs through Mesot. I've kind of gotten interested in the canal system that they built around this river, and I haven't seen, I haven't paid any attention to what the canal system and the river looks like over there in that part of the city. So that's where I'm going to go, look for the river, see if I can walk alongside it, and um, as we walk along, I'll look for interesting things, and um, yeah, tell you some of the thoughts that are on my mind today. I'm still somewhat in hibernation mode, I think, here in Mesot. So I've been listening to a lot of podcasts, still watching a lot of movies and uh, TV shows. And uh, one of the podcasts that really stuck in my mind for some reason was another one from Radiolab. And the uh, name of this episode, I believe, was Baby Blue Blood Drive. And I'll put a link to the uh, podcast uh, in the description in case you want to listen to it yourself. And oddly enough, despite the title, Baby Blue Blood Drive, this uh, podcast is about one of the most fascinating creatures on the planet, horseshoe crabs. Like a lot of people, I've been interested in horseshoe crabs almost my whole life, from the first day that I saw one, you know? Um, you know, saw them on TV in a nature show many, many, many years ago. I think one of the first things that jumps out at anybody when they look at a horseshoe crab is, of course, how strange they look and how dangerous they look, to be honest. I mean, they have like a suit of armor on top, you know, the carapace, or however you pronounce that. Underneath, they've got a whole bunch of deadly looking claws, you know, looking like they could tear you apart. And then at the back, they have that long, sharp tail, you know, that looks like a stinger and looks like it's poised to uh, kill you and poison you in a second, you know. You see one of these things, and the last thing you want to do is touch it or get anywhere near it. It, uh, it actually has always reminded me of the creatures, the Horta, in that old episode of Star Trek. You know, if you're a Star Trek fan, you know what I'm talking about. The silicon-based horda. And, uh, yeah, every time I see these horseshoe crabs, I, I think of the uh, horda. Anyway, one of the first things you learn in this uh, podcast is that despite these horseshoe crab... <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> I don't know how much of that I caught on camera, but a uh, rather large dog there. Yikes, decided to uh, take a bite out of my leg. He, uh, he didn't make it though. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what it is about me and dogs lately. They uh, don't seem to like me here in uh, Mesot. Anyway, my heart rate is going down little adrenaline dump, you know, in my, I can feel my legs are a little bit uh, ready to run because of that. <laughs> that dog really uh, scared me that time. Yeah, I wasn't expecting that at all. Anyway, I was just saying that uh, despite how dangerous the, hor the um, horseshoe crabs look, what you learn in the podcast is uh, they're not really dangerous at all. Um, the stinger, I mean, the tail, for example, is not a stinger. It's just a tail that they use to keep themselves oriented, you know, when they swim. And um, yeah, you can poke yourself with it, you can, you know, jab it into your skin, and it has no effect at all. It's not a stinger in any way. You know, jabbing yourself with that uh, tail is kind of like poking yourself with a stick, you know, no different than that. So you don't have to worry about the tail at all. It's not a stinger. And in this podcast, they get quite close to the um, 
horseshoe crabs and they pick them up and put them on their hand and everyone in the podcast reacts the same way that these horseshoe crab with all their claws are very gentle and they put the crab on their hand and then the crab will just sort of grab their hand with their claws and just kind of hold them not too tightly but just sort of grasp them the way they describe it, it it sounds like it's almost like another human holding your hand you know it's like they grab their hands and they just kind of hold them close you know like they're holding on to them for comfort or something so yeah so the uh, the tail is not a stinger the claws are not very strong they don't pinch you or bite you into your flesh or anything you could actually put one on your hand and they would just sort of gently grasp your hand and kind of hug your hand you know and that's all they do they don't have teeth in their mouth or anything like that so they're not going to bite you so yeah they're not uh, dangerous in any way they're actually quite gentle you know friendly little creatures which is comes as quite a surprise you know when you listen to this podcast oh check this out i was walking along and i felt something really weird on my uh, sandal i kept crying trying to scrape it off and i finally looked and this thing was actually this piece of metal was sticking all the way into my sandal and uh, it's like a nail or something a, a barbed wire so i walked on that and the thing uh, nearly jammed into my foot anyway so i had to uh, had to remove that well i've reached the point of the main road where the river and canal is and i think the last time i was walking along the canal i came from that direction and i stopped over there because you can see it's all fallen apart here and i I couldn't go any further so this is the furthest i've ever come and i guess they're still doing uh, the repairs here and then this is the side that i was interested in and check that out more disneyland jungle that is so crazy and uh, there's a um, sidewalk on this side and a sidewalk going along that side as well so i guess i just have to uh, pick a side and see if i can walk along it it looks pretty overgrown all these bushes are like actually covering up the trail and over there as well so right or left which way should i go I think I'm going to try right first and see how far I can get. The first barrier, but I think I can get past this pretty easily. Ah, these canals are so interesting. You can see, oh, it looks like there's actually a, um, a split here maybe the river goes in two different directions because it looks like there's a, a channel heading off in that direction and then one of them going straight oh <laughs> well I am not getting very far on this side so that uh, is very clear it just comes to an end here with a barrier Okay, so maybe the river does not go in that direction that heads off there. And then you can see there's uh, sidewalks continuing on both sides there. Actually, yeah, this whole thing is fascinating to me. Someone mentioned in a comment calling these plants hyacinths. And that makes sense. That name feels right. These are probably hyacinth. And these ones are uh, flowering right now. You can see those uh, pink flowers down there. Ah, check out this uh, this plant here. I find that is one uh, advantage to... It's like one advantage I've discovered over the years of doing photography or now shooting video. You tend to be much more aware of your surroundings. So if I were walking around without the camera, I probably would not stop to look closely at plants and things like that. But because I have the camera, I find I'm always looking around and and I see things more clearly, 
you know, and, I, and I, I'm more interested in the things that I see around me just because I'm uh, shooting video. So I'm back at the main road again. There's the bridge over the road, and that's the construction area over there. As you see, the water, runoff water from the city, you know, pours into this canal and then continues along its way. So I'm going to cross over to that side and then see how far I can get. And here's the trail on the other side. Not quite as blocked by plants as you can see. Wow, okay, they got some security on this side. Must be a hotel or could be a residence. And they've got, uh, yeah, it looks like electric wire along the top there. And I'm not going to touch that wire to see if it's uh, currently electrified. <laughs> Here's the uh, corner. Uh, that's where I was over there. That's where it ends on that side. Look at the, uh, the jungle setting over here around uh, that giant tree in the middle. So far it's open, but clearly not many people ever use this walkway. Otherwise, you know, a plant like this one ahead of me would not be able to grow like that. It would be pushed back by people uh, trying to get past it. Oh man, it looks like uh, <laughs> there's a reason for that. I'm not going to be able to get very far. Oh, it looks, oh, it looks like people have just made a trail on this side. Ah. But it looks like it dead ends over here too. And there's a gap. Actually, uh, oh no, looks like um, if I'm careful, I'll be able to work my way across. What do you think? Let's, uh, <laughs> this is turning into a bit more of a physical adventure than I expected, but I think I'm up for the challenge. Let's see. It looks like people go this way. Oh yeah, just have to uh, hop down to these steps and then uh, climb up the other side. Doesn't look like it's, uh, you know, built for people to do this on a regular basis. But uh, if you're in mildly good shape, this isn't a problem. Ah, look at that. So there's an uh, alleyway comes from the main street <laughs> with its own with his own um, toilet placed grandly there in the middle. I'm assuming that toilet is not hooked up to anything, but uh, you never know. And I am not going to open the lid. I am not. <laughs> All right, now we have to make it across uh, to here. And there, we made it across the gap. And now we're sort of in the uh, back areas of uh, homes and businesses here. And uh, I'm going to keep my eyes open for any sleeping dogs because they're not going to be happy to see me. Yeah, look at this though. They even have a uh, nice uh, bench sitting here. So I'm going to take advantage of this bench and just sit down for a second just for fun. My GoPro is uh, tilting on an angle over there, looking like it wants to fall over on its uh, three-way tripod. But uh, I think it'll be uh, steady for uh, a minute or two. Just to get back to uh, horseshoe crabs, we've established that they, uh, they look dangerous, but really they're not dangerous in any way. They don't have a stinger. They, they don't hurt you with the claws. They don't have, you know, teeth in their mouth that will bite you or anything like that. Um, and the other really amazing thing about horseshoe crabs is how old they are, of course. Um, they've been dated back to 450 million years ago. They've seen fossils of these creatures around forever, basically. And uh, that sounds like a big number, but when you start to think about it, that number gets bigger and bigger and bigger because these horseshoe crab, as a species, 
have lived through endless events that have wiped out other life forms on the planet. You know, I mean, the Earth has gone through so many, you know, ice ages and meteor striking. You know, of course, we've got the big meteor strike, you know, 65 million years ago or whenever it was that wiped out all of the dinosaurs. And these horseshoe crab down there doing horseshoe crab things, you know, they just kind of look around and go, oh, okay, the world ended again. Doesn't bug us. We're just going to keep being horseshoe crab and we're going to live forever, you know, apparently. And uh, it seems like one of the biggest threats they've ever faced actually is us, you know, the industrial age of, of humans. It seems to be having more of an effect on their population than anything else. And yet, even, you know, to them, even us, you know, humans really are just nothing. We're just like a blink of an eye to them in terms of their 450 million year, you know, uh, lifespan they're going to survive us no problem. And then if we disappear, you know, horseshoe crab are just going to continue on into the future, probably for hundreds of millions of more years. And um, yeah, they won't remember us in any way. Just a crazy thing to think just how old these, uh, these guys are. And now we're getting to the point of the podcast, which is, you know, the most interesting thing about these horseshoe crab, as far as this podcast is concerned, is that they have blue blood, which I didn't know until I listened to the podcast. We, of course, and all mammals in general, I think we all have red blood, and that's because of the hemoglobin in our blood, which carries oxygen, gives our blood the red color. Um, when oxygen bonds with the hemoglobin, you know, it, it creates this reddish color, and our, our blood is red when it's filled with oxygen. Horseshoe crab are different because the thing that carries oxygen in their blood is copper-based, which seems insane to me. I didn't know that either. How in the world can that be true? But apparently it's true. Whatever carries oxygen in their blood is based on copper. And for whatever reason, because it is copper-based, when it binds with oxygen, it creates a baby blue, like a sky blue color. So the blood of horseshoe crabs is a nice baby blue. And the title of the podcast is Baby Blue Blood Drive. So what does the horseshoe crab have to do with a blood drive? That's really amazing. Time to continue my walk along the uh, canal. And as I said, I'm going to be very aware of my surroundings this time because it just looks like prime dog territory and I think any dogs back here will think this is their property and they have to uh, defend it. Hello. 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 Ooh. <laughs> it's like an obstacle course. Now you've got to jump over the mops. Oh, it's nice back here though, so quiet compared to walking along the streets. And, uh, oh, okay, I just noticed this wire strung all the way along, and of course that would be for uh, laundry. And the uh, sidewalk on the other side is continuing the whole direction as well. So maybe as far as I can get, I'll be able to walk, cross over, and then come back along the other side. All right. I'm sort of speaking quietly because I feel like I'm, I don't know. <laughs> I don't. Oh, and there's me, me in the mirror. Getting a bit uh, hot and sweaty. Okay, this is the back door of a uh, restaurant. Uh-oh, it's looking like another barrier that I may not be able to get past. Oh no, okay. I thought it was blocked completely there, but uh, be able to cut through there pretty easily. Okay, uh, horseshoe crabs have blue blood because of the copper in it, apparently. Which is, again strikes me as kind of weird because when I think of copper, I think of orange copper wiring. So why would orange copper make your blood blue? But hey, 
This is what the uh, biologists are uh, telling me. And, uh, oh, got to duck down to get through here. But more importantly, in the blood of these horseshoe crabs, they have specialized cells called amoebocytes. And these amoebocytes attack invading bacteria and viruses. And apparently, these amoebocytes are like our white blood cells on steroids. They're much more effective and more powerful than the systems that we have in our body, or there's something unique about them, something special about them. When these amoebocytes detect an invading bacteria or virus, they somehow surround that virus with a gel, which stops it in its tracks. You know, it makes me think of that scene from The Incredibles, where Mr. Incredible is, you know, in, in, on the island, I think, the island fortress, he's trying to get inside, and he triggers an alarm, and all these guns come out and shoot him with these balls, these sticky balls that hit him, and then start to expand. And no matter how strong, how powerful Mr. Incredible is, once these sticky balls expand and trap his limbs, he can't go anywhere, and he's completely helpless. And that's what these amoebocytes do to invading bacteria and viruses. They kind of shoot out this gel that surrounds the bacteria and holds them immobile. They can't go anywhere. And then that gives the defenses of the horseshoe crab time to attack it and, and immobilize it. And they speculate that it might be these very, you know, amoebocytes uh, is why the horseshoe crab have managed to survive for, you know, 450 million years. That might be their secret. And uh, humans have figured out a way to use this. So again, this is something I knew nothing about. This is turning into a long horseshoe crab story, but I'll try to uh, wind it up. They found out that they can use this property of the horseshoe crab blood, these amoebocytes, to test for the presence of bacteria in other things. So, for example, you know, when injectable medicines were invented, like morphine, things like that, people often got sick, you know, because we're injecting something directly into our blood, and there might be dangerous bacteria in the morphine solution. So, what people discovered in their laboratories doing all this testing is that if they used, if they extracted the amoebocytes from the horseshoe crab blood, they could develop this serum and they can test other things to see whether it has a bacterial infection of any kind. So a huge industry has developed where they use this horseshoe crab blood to test medical apparatus. So almost everything that has ever touched your body in your lifetime because of a medical procedure, whether, you know, a needle or anything like that, chances are it has been tested with horseshoe crab blood to make sure that there is no bacterial infection on the surface. Now, <laughs> uh, baby blue blood drive, that comes from the fact that in order to get this horseshoe crab blood, you basically have to drain the blood from horseshoe crabs. And there are a number of large companies uh, around the world, or mainly in the United States, I think, that do this. So every year, um, about 500,000 horseshoe crabs are taken from the ocean, brought to laboratories where they are strapped down with bungee cords, and then they drain about one third of their blood into these bottles. And it's really amazing to see because the blood dripping into these bottles really is baby blue. This is the strangest thing. These images of blood being drained from these horseshoe crab in these laboratories is like some of the weirdest science fiction imagery you've ever seen. And I had no idea this was going on. This was all new information to me. And of course, over the years, procedures have been put in place to be as gentle and as protective of the horseshoe crab as possible. So I think there are rules in place that any horseshoe crab taken out of the ocean for it to have its blood drained must be returned to the ocean within 24 hours, I think. At least that's the rule in the United States. Um, 
But even so, yeah, it, it, it definitely has kind of a ghoulish quality to it, you know, when you think about it, when you see the images. But, uh, but yeah, this is all brand new information to me that uh, I knew nothing about, that horseshoe crabs were, you know, collected, half a million of them every year, to drain their blood, and then they use this blood to develop the serum that is used to test for bacterial infections in medical apparatus. And this connects with our situation right now, because even as, you know, all over the world, companies are competing to produce the first very effective vaccine for our current virus, um, they're, you know, planning ahead and developing, you know, all these little vaccine vials where they're going to put the vaccine uh, uh, ultimately. And all of these vials have to be tested with this horseshoe crab blood extract to make sure that they're clean and are not carrying any kind of a bacterial or viral infection. So it kind of, yeah, this whole episode of the podcast connected with our uh, situation in the world right now. One last point about the horseshoe crabs. Um, they have developed a synthetic alternative which does the same thing as the horseshoe crab blood. So as this develops, they may not have to harvest um, horseshoe crab blood anymore in the future. But I think this technique is still being developed and is still being perfected and it needs a lot of approval from FDA and all these different agencies. So uh, it's still, the horseshoe crab blood is still the main source of this testing for bacterial infections. But in the future, they might switch over from that to a, a, a synthetic uh, version of it. So anyway, that's the Radio Lab podcast that has stuck in my mind this week. Still continuing along the uh, canal, the river, and a lot more water flowing here. You know, not nearly as much uh, hyacinth growing. And I assume this has been built for flood control. Got another jungle tunnel to work through here. I've been hearing so much about snakes in Thailand that I keep thinking with all this walking along the canal, I should at some point come across some kind of <laughs> snake. Okay, that was embarrassing. <laughs> A little insect, you know, landed on my, uh, on my thumb here and it just kind of um, scared me for a minute. So I shook it off. <laughs> it must have been talking about snakes because I don't usually react that way. Um, insects don't bother me in any way. And usually when they land on me, I'm just kind of interested in them and I kind of go, oh, look at that insect. But this one kind of freaked me out for a second. <laughs> and then he disappeared. Oh, this is awesome. It just goes on and on. This is probably the longest navigable section of a canal sidewalk I've come across so far in Mesot. And I wasn't expecting this at all. I honestly thought it would just kind of peter out and then I wouldn't be able to continue any farther. But it's actually getting uh, wider and uh, contains more and more water the more I walk along it. now I'm seeing a lot more of these, I guess you'd call them uh, lily pads. Yeah, I think you'd call them lily pads. They don't look particularly healthy though, and I don't see a lot of uh, fish or any other animals down there. Whoa! Oh, I just uh, clicked on, hit something with my foot. And this appears to be a giant snail of some kind. When I first saw it, I, I, I was just convinced it was uh, not alive anymore. But if you look at the bottom, you know, is that um, the, the living creature inside the shell? Yeah, maybe he's taking a nap during the 
hot part of the day and then he'll start moving along. There you go, buddy. You just uh, stay right there. And here's another interesting fruit tree. Some large... If I paid attention to fruit, I'd probably know instantly what these are, but I don't even know what they are. And apparently they're uh, edible. They seem to be taking care of them. They have some down there inside uh, plastic bags to protect them. And I have no idea what that could be. There's a plastic bag full of something that they've tied to the branch with tape. So I don't know what's uh, going on here. A lot of these houses along the canal get to be surrounded by all these shade trees, which is nice. And then these uh, bamboo groves as well. And it looks like my canal is coming up on a street here. I'll have to see whether I can continue on the other side or whether it's time to turn around. Oh, what's going on here? I've got some kind of a, uh, I assume this is a fishing apparatus. I've got a counterweight over here. And then on the end of this bamboo, a rope or a wire going down into the water. So I assume there's some kind of a cage down there. I wonder what they're trying to catch. And they've got some of these machines here that uh, aerate the water. So maybe uh, there's been a little bit of fish farming going on here from time to time. At least I assume that's what those are. Oh, look at that. Yep. The sidewalk is wide open on the other side. Guess we have to uh, continue along. The other big thing that has stuck in my mind from my last couple of days of hibernation is, believe it or not, the movie Crazy Rich Asians. I'm a bit late to the party with that movie because I think it, it came out a while ago and made a big splash. You know, when it came out, everybody was talking about it. But I finally got around to watching it. And considering the type of movie it is, it really shouldn't be stuck in my head as much as it is. I mean, it's really just a light-hearted romp full of outlandish characters and, you know, crazy sets and crazy scenes. You know, crazy rich Asians, you know. The title tells you exactly uh, what the movie is like. So you wouldn't think uh, I would uh, be thinking about it that much, but for a variety of reasons, it really has stuck with me. And... Uh, I mean, I might be taking it way too seriously, but I think one of the reasons it stuck with me is that I have a real problem with um, excessive displays of wealth or wasting money. Maybe that comes from uh, being able, having the chance to go to a few countries around the world. And then when you see these, you know, a movie where it's pretty much all about how rich we are and how much money we can spend on totally ridiculous things like, you know, I spent 20 million on my wedding. Oh, I spent 40 million on my wedding. And for a, uh, you know, bachelor party, instead of having a beer at the local pub, no, I'm going to rent an entire ship and spend, you know, millions and millions and millions on just this one bachelor party. And for the bachelorette party, of course, in the movie, they rent out an entire island in Indonesia and every guest at the bachelorette party is given a, you know, a five-minute shopping spree at some expensive store that they set up just for this event. There are all of these uber-rich people who are, you know, fantastically wealthy already. Suddenly, they just turn into crazy people rushing into this place and just grabbing as much stuff as they can because it's all free. Ah, uh, you know, I mean, I get it. You don't want to take it too seriously. It's just a fun movie. And I think we all enjoy sort of seeing the lifestyles of the rich and famous and wondering what it would be like to have, you know, a hundred million dollars or several billion dollars and 
you don't have to worry about the things that normal people have to worry about. But somehow the ostentatious displays of wealth kind of, you know, kind of put my teeth on edge, you know, kind of bug me a little bit when I'm watching this movie. And for that reason, maybe I took it a bit more seriously than I was supposed to. We're back in the uh, hyacinth country and we've even got some some soil has grown up here and a whole bunch of uh, yeah banana trees. Very cool. The hidden world of uh, Mesot. And that's where we're continuing our walk. The story of Crazy Rich Asians is pretty simple. I think everybody knows it because you've seen the movie or you've seen the trailer. It's not a big secret. You know, the basic idea is that a, um, a woman, Chinese-American woman, um, is hanging out with her boyfriend in the United States. And her boyfriend is from Singapore. And then one day her boyfriend says, hey, why don't we go back to Singapore? You can meet my family. You know, my best friend is getting married. You can come to the wedding. And of course, our, uh, the heroine of our story, Rachel, she learns in stages that her boyfriend is far from a normal Singaporean. In fact, he is a member of probably the richest family in Singapore. An old, very powerful, very traditional, uber rich, crazy rich family. And her boyfriend, who apparently is a bit of a jerk because he never told her anything about this and did not prepare Rachel for it in any way, just basically sprung it on her. You know, they're, they're, they're flying to Singapore and it's like, oh, by the way, you know, my family is incredibly rich and um, they're probably going to hate you, you know, because you are a, you know, low-born commoner from America you know, and you don't have all the traditional Chinese values that we still hold. So yeah, don't worry about it. My family will hate you, but, and we're super rich, but let's, let's go to Singapore for my best friend's wedding. And that's basically the uh, setup of the movie. Before I say anything else negative that makes you think I hated the movie, I'll point out, you know, you know, a lot of the positives of the movie. And basically, it's just really fun. You know, it's an entertaining movie, a lot of uh, activity, a lot of crazy characters, beautiful sets. Um, of course, because they're in Singapore and they're trying to show Singapore in the best light possible. So in this movie, there has to be a solid 10 minutes of just the camera zooming in on the Marina Bay Sands and that uh, special garden area behind the Marina Bay Sands. You know, it during the daytime and at night, I mean, it's a beautiful setting and the movie made, took full advantage of the modern beauty of uh, Singapore. Plus, of course, it's pretty much a 100% Asian cast with a lot of the, uh, you know, the actors that we're familiar with in, in North America, as well as a whole bunch that, you know, are not as well known. But it's quite, you know, interesting to see an all Asian cast in a big budget, you know, fancy movie like that. So yeah, the movie itself, yeah, it's a lot of fun and uh, beautifully shot and yeah, very, uh, very entertaining. Something you, of course, come across a lot in uh, Thailand and in Asia in general. You'll find uh, small shrines like this built up in uh, public areas. And this one is uh, in a very nice setting here, right beside the uh, canal. Got a you know, carved wooden elephants down there, an incense pot. Yeah, it's very nice. And we might have reached the point where it's time to turn around. And I was hoping I could just cross over to the other side and continue back. Everything looks open and easy on the other side, but there's no access over there, at least no public access. Let's take a look on the other side and see what's going on. Ah, okay. So it looks like we've reached the official end of the developed portion of the river. And there are no more cement 
walls, no more sidewalks after this point. Looks like they're just starting to uh, build the cement uh, walls. And I assume, of course, that's done to uh, reduce erosion. That as the water flows along, it'll cut away the edges and then cut away the land from all the houses along the edge. And they don't want that, so they're going to uh, build the cement canal all the way around it. And this is the other side. And they don't have obvious uh, public access to go down here. But I'm just going to uh, hop over the fence anyway. From what I saw, this was like a very easy and open walk on the way back. So I'm going to uh, just jump over and uh, continue back along the other side. All right, we're on the other side now. <laughs> As you can see, it was not, not exactly a, a feat of superhuman agility to uh, hop over that uh, cement barrier there. So let's walk along uh, the canal on the way back. I thought if I couldn't walk along the canal, I would just duck into some of the uh, neighborhood local streets here and wind my way back. But uh, yeah, I'm in the mood to keep walking along the canal. From what I saw on uh, Google Maps and maps.me, there are quite a few hotels, you know, alongside the canal. It's interesting though, that none of them can actually take advantage of the canal being there because um, like even that, that looks like a hotel there, but they have a giant wall separating their grounds from the canal just for security and privacy, I guess. So their guests can't actually, you know, come out of the hotel and then stroll along the canal, which is kind of a shame. But then again, this canal clearly was not built for public strolling like this. That's something only uh, crazy foreigners like me do. I think the movie Crazy Rich Asians kind of bugged me a little bit too because there was such a gap between what seemed to be the message they were delivering and what they actually... Uh oh <laughs> I don't know if I can continue on this side either. We'll see. Um, and, you know, what actually happens in the movie. You know, for example, the big deal was that the, uh, the main woman for our hero's family in Singapore, the guy's name is Nick, by the way, the boyfriend. His mother is Eleanor, and she's the main antagonist of the movie, I guess, because, of course, she disapproves of her son's girlfriend. Rachel, you know, this poor American. And she goes on and on about how, as an American, she lacks the traditional Chinese values about, you know, family being important and that kind of thing. And yet, at the same time, when you look around Eleanor's family, this rich family in Singapore, it's a bit of a nightmare. I mean, she talks on and on and on about how important family is, but it seems like everyone in that family is really kind of uh, the money has turned them into crazy people. They're into debauchery and, and they don't seem to care about other family members. They only care about spending their money and then living this crazy, vulgar life. So I don't think she really had the moral high ground as much as she thought she did. And I kept expecting Rachel, the girlfriend, you know, to fight back, you know, to stand up for herself. You know, it's like, you know, what do you, you don't have... You don't have a uh, monopoly on family values, you know. I live with my mother and we ta I take care of my mother, she takes care of me, you know. you know. But she never did actually fight back in that way. Anyway, this is what uh, startled me, that it looked like uh, I was running into another barrier. But no, I think I can uh, keep going around this. Ooh, there's a big insect, man. Some kind of a uh, large black bee. You probably can't see him in the GoPro too too well. With my red shirt, he probably thinks I'm like this uh, 
delicious flower, and that's why he's hanging out, trying to get closer and closer. <laughs> so I better move along. Sorry, buddy, I am not a flower. No pollen for you. Well, I'm hoping I can uh, reconnect with the sidewalk at the other side of this uh, construction area. Ah, there it is right there. Oh, what's going on over here? I'm digging a hole for some reason. Uh, a dog heard me, but luckily he's behind that fence. All right, back. Back to civilization. Uh oh <laughs> no look at that I've been I've been barred you shall not pass this canal is telling me that's where I want to go <laughs> but I'm not getting across here not a chance there is no uh, no way looks like that has actually even been built up all those branches put there maybe to act as more of a barrier i don't know anyway that's where's where i want to be and uh, this is uh, where i am so really basically i have to uh, turn back around maybe i can uh, find a way in over here somewhere do a google map check to figure out where i am yeah, it's a beautiful area back here though. Very nice, especially with this uh, blue sky with the clouds. I just checked Google Maps and I think I can uh, find my way uh, back to the river pretty easily. I think I can just go through this construction site, get to the road and then a uh, little dipsy doodle and I'll be back on track. Yeah, I can just head out this way back to the road. And Rachel, the girlfriend in Crazy Rich Asians, she kind of bugged me too, because the whole point of the movie was supposed to be that she was this simple, um, kind of independent, fun-loving American, you know, very different from the traditional Singaporean style. And yet, she really wasn't that way at all. She really wasn't that much different from, you know, her boyfriend Nick and, and their family. And when the movie kind of came to a climax where she really had to stand up for herself and fight back, instead of embracing her American, you know, traditions of independence and, and um, modernity, maybe, she went the other way. She actually did one of those giant makeover sessions you see in so many movies you know like pretty woman and all that kind of thing where you know she has a team of like 20 people basically giving her a makeover from top to bottom you know basically even put a tiara on her head and made her into a uber rich princess basically and then she made her grand entrance at the wedding and suddenly all of these rich people from singapore were now impressed with her. And that really bugged me because the whole point was supposed to be that she was not part of this rich um, society. You know, she was supposed to be there to shake things up. And then when she fought back against them, all she did was dress up like one of them and basically outdid them, you know, on their own ground. I wanted her to show up at that wedding in blue jeans and cowboy boots and, you know, shock Singaporean high society. But she went in the other direction and actually dressed up like one of them, right? And I don't know, it just seemed like a weird message. Interestingly enough, there was one character in this film played by Aquafina, and I love, I've come to love Aquafina. Her character, I think, was called Peck Lin, and she was born in Singapore in the movie, 
um, but she, you know, spent a lot of time as a student or something in the United States. But she was much more American in tone and style than Rachel was. And I think the movie would have been much more interesting and much more fun if she was Nick's girlfriend instead of Rachel. Because, you know, she, she really was uh, fun-loving and a really independent and a unique kind of person. You know, this character that Aquafina played, I loved her. She stole every scene she was in. To my mind, she stole the whole movie. And um, I think uh, she should have been, you know, this rebel American stealing away the uh, rich son from this rich family. That would have been, that would have made a lot more sense. But anyway, the other thing that kind of bothered me about Rachel is that uh, they never stopped telling us that she was some kind of a genius. You know, she was a economics professor at NYU, I think. And over and over, they kept telling us, like, oh, you are, you know, you're an economics professor. You know, you must be so smart. And everyone agreed about that, and she agreed as well, you know. Everybody agreed that she was, like, super intelligent. But she never, ever did anything to show that she was intelligent in any way. Quite the opposite, in fact. I think the only time economics came up was when she... Um, had this conversation with a woman about microfinance. And this was supposed to, you know, prove her credentials as, as an economics professor. And I hate to break it to her, but, you know, I'm not a genius and I'm not an economics professor. But even I know all about microfinance. You know, I even know about the Bangladeshi economist who won the Nobel Peace Prize for inventing microfinance. It's not like this is some sort of a, you know, big secret. <laughs> so, anyway, this idea that Rachel, you know, was this genius economics professor, they kept saying it, but there was nothing about her that, you know, illustrated this to me in any way. So she was kind of a uh, problematic character for me in the movie. I've reached the intersection. It's a beautiful uh, temple over there. But uh, I'm more focused on the canal today. And if I'm right, I think I can turn here and then rejoin the canal heading back. And here we are. It's interesting that some sections look like they've been blocked off, you know, forever. Like right from the day that they were uh, built. I mean, this entrance to this uh, side here, you actually have to go into private property, it looks like. And they've kind of built up a bamboo fence, which implies they don't want you walking down the sidewalk. But on this side, check it out, wide open. You know, it's just uh, no barrier at all. And it's just a nice wide sidewalk that apparently anyone can walk down. Yeah, I'm not sure why. Different sections are treated uh, differently. We're right back at the spot where I saw the, uh, the, some sort of a fishing setup over there with probably a cage down at the bottom. And we're going to walk this way. Just a quick interlude about my ongoing technology adventures. It strikes me more and more that a lot of this gear that I use is not designed for the climate of uh, Southeast Asia. Because right now I need to change my GoPro battery. The one in the camera is down to 1%. And I can't get the battery out because it has expanded. Like all of my GoPro batteries have expanded. So the sides are much wider than they were when I bought them. I guess because of the heat here and the way the GoPro overheats. And now when I open up the GoPro, the battery has expanded so much inside the GoPro, I can't get it out. I can't, uh, yeah, so far I've been trying and trying and I can't pull the battery out. I guess I have to wait for it to cool down. Well, after a few minutes, I was able to pull it out. And I don't know if you can see it or not, but this battery, the sides have burst open. And, you know, when I pinch it, it closes quite a bit. You can see the edges are open. So basically, this battery and a couple of other of my GoPro batteries, which are not cheap, by the way, um, basically are kind of useless now. 
because the heat caused them to expand and they're, you know, soon they're going to explode, I think. Oh well, one dead battery. One last thought about the movie Crazy Rich Asians. Um, I was, I found one character also quite fascinating. The character's name was Astrid and her husband's name was Michael. Uh, the actress playing Astrid, by the way, is a Gemma Chan, uh, born in the UK, I believe. Um, I've seen her in a few things and she always jumps out at me. Um, I saw her originally in the uh, science fiction series Humans, which really kind of makes me smile because whenever I see her, I think she can't be human. I mean, nobody can be that beautiful. You know what I mean? She's just like absolutely stunning. And every time I look at her, I think she can't be real because no human being can be that perfect. And then in the TV show Humans, she in fact plays a synthetic, like an android, who of course is supposed to be, you know, more than human. You know, stronger, smarter, faster, more attractive, all those sorts of things. So it just kind of makes sense that uh, Gemma Chan would play a, uh, an android because, you know, she is just so perfect. But in the movie uh, Crazy Rich Asians, she and her husband had quite an interesting relationship, like a really complicated one, I thought. And the few times they, you know, they were having trouble in their, in their marriage. And then when they were talking about it, it was like, wow, that's... There's something really interesting going on there, and yet they never really, you know, kind of, it wasn't the focus of the movie in any way, so they never really went into it. But uh, anyway, I found her character um, quite interesting in the movie. I would have liked to have uh, seen a lot more of her and uh, uh, her situation. So that's uh, Crazy Rich Asians. Like I said, it's kind of a fun romp. You know, it's a pretty old story that we've all kind of seen a thousand times before, either, you know, from the point of view of, um, you know, a boyfriend or girlfriend bringing home a boyfriend or girlfriend to meet the family, and of course the family doesn't approve of them, and then hilarity ensues, or the idea of someone who's very poor, from a poor background, suddenly finding themselves in rich society, kind of like pretty woman, as I mentioned before. So you've sort of seen the story in Crazy Rich Asians, you know, a million times already. But the setting of Singapore and the over-the-top nature of a lot of the scenes kind of made it interesting for me. Um, like, <laughs> if, you, if you've seen the movie, you know what I'm talking about when I reference the wedding, the centerpiece event of the movie, and the scale of the wedding, the decorations in the church. It was just unbelievable. You know, it was really uh, quite something to see. I don't know whether it was vulgar to the point of being horrible or so amazing to the point of being wonderful. I'm not sure which way I would go on that, but either way, it was uh, pretty incredible. Anyway, one of the first things you learn in this uh, podcast is that despite these horseshoe crab... <laughs> so I walked on that and the thing uh, nearly 
jammed into my foot. And I'm not going to touch that wire to see if it's uh, currently electrified. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to get very far, but it looks like it dead ends over here too. I'm assuming that toilet is not hooked up to anything, but uh, you never know. And I am not going to open the lid. I'm going to keep my eyes open for any sleeping dogs. My GoPro is uh, tilting on an angle over there, looking like it wants to fall over. It looks like prime dog territory. It's like an obstacle course. Now you've got to jump over the mops. Uh oh, it's looking like another barrier that I may not be able to get past in all these different agencies. So uh, it's still, I should at some point come across some kind of <laughs> <laughs> and it just kind of um, scared me for a minute, so I shook it off. It hit something with my foot, and this appears to be a giant snail of some kind. Large black bee. You shall not pass, this canal is telling me. I just check Google Maps, and I think I can uh, find my way. Ugh. I can't, uh... yeah, so far I've been trying and trying, and I can't pull the battery out. Oh, I forgot about this. On this side, it also ends. Oh no. <laughs> and you can see, you know, how badly it's scraped up my arm and there's like a real allergic reaction going on. Pretty. <laughs> the dog, the dog thinks it's a private property. And you can see that they're very popular with these hornets or wasps or whatever they are, clouds of them. Ooh, got somebody here uh, hunting something in the river. It's got like a, a homemade uh, gun. Upon a closer inspection, I don't think it was a gun. It looked more like a, like a, a weird crossbow style uh, fishing rod. Which makes a lot more sense. He's there uh, fishing, not about to. Uh, cause <laughs> as I was walking up on the guy, what I thought was a gun, you know, was like pointing directly at my chest. And I thought, oh, that's not, uh, not safe. <laughs>